Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to analyze the Hindu dated 11th of February 2020. Displayed on the screen is a list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description of the video. Let's begin with our analysis. Page number 10 of today's newspaper presents a landmark judgment by Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court has highlighted that reservation cannot be asked as a right. At the same time, Supreme Court highlights that ensuring adequate representation to disadvantaged section, for example, SCSTs, is more of a state obligation and it cannot be demanded as a right. Now, in this context, Supreme Court has said that there is no fundamental right to claim reservation in promotion. The latest judgment by the Supreme Court is the reminder of the fact that affirmative action programs allowed in the Constitution flow from enabling provisions and these are not rights as such. Now in the context it is very clear to us that this topic is important from the perspective of polity and governance and its relevance is for both prelims as well as for mains. In the context of the news it is important for us to understand what is the meaning of affirmative action. So by affirmative action we mean that all the actions taken by the state to ensure implementation of fundamental rights for its citizens. Now when we talk about the state, it means the action taken by legislature, executive as well as judiciary. In this sense, the Supreme Court has defined fundamental rights as sacrosanct and they should be ensured at any cost. At the same time, Supreme Court also used the term enabling provisions to highlight the difference between fundamental rights and the justification to say that reservation cannot be asked as a right. Now let's try to understand the difference between fundamental rights and enabling provisions in simple words. Now we are aware of the fact that fundamental rights are given in the part 3 of the Indian constitution. These rights are basically guaranteed against the state and if there is any tendency or action which is taken by the state through executive or any other body to abridge them without an adequate sufficient social justification, then this can be resisted. Fundamental rights give individuals power to move to the court in such cases and seek installation of fundamental rights for them or as a group. At the same time, these fundamental rights also guarantee that no law can be formulated that violates the provision of the constitution and when we talk about the provisions we are talking about the fundamental rights. Any law which is antagonistic to fundamental rights shall be declared null and void. So what is the meaning of enabling provisions? Enabling provisions could be said to be a section or a statute that gives an option or a choice to the government official to place it into power and usage. Here the important term that we should understand is option or choice. Since it is an option or a choice, it is something which would not be ensured by constitution where non-fulfillment amounts to a legal claim or an action. So in simple words, when we are talking about enabling provisions, these are dependent on the state will and cannot be guaranteed through writs. And this is what the court has highlighted. Now let's try to understand the background of this entire case. Now in 2012, Uttarakhand government tried to fill its post in the public works department and in the notification which was published by the government, there was no provision for reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in context to the promotion. Some communities felt disturbed by the fact and they went to the court. This decision was challenged in the Uttarakhand High Court and the Uttarakhand High Court struck the government's decision to not include the provisions of reservation for promotion. Uttarakhand government was of the view that they are under no obligation to offer reservation in the field of promotion, so they challenged the decision of the High Court in the Supreme Court. The latest decision that we see today in the news item is more of a reflection of what Supreme Court has to say on reservation. The Supreme Court has decided that states are not bound to make reservation. And while stating this, Supreme Court has used the provision of enabling power. Supreme Court further said that reservation in promotions is not a fundamental right. 
and it cannot order the state government to provide reservations. The court further clarified that it is the discretion of the state government to give reservations to its citizen. At the same time, the parameter for reservation should be well defined and the state should collect quantifiable data which shows that these communities are inadequately represented in public services. The Supreme Court has clarified that state can grant reservation to certain classes but there must be some material on the basis of which the opinion is formed. So in this case or context, this quantifiable data becomes a point of discussion and this will be a point of debate as well in the time to come. Now let's try to understand the constitutional basis of the Supreme Court's decision by going through the provisions of the constitution itself. Now in this context, it is important for us to know the constitutional provisions for a better understanding. Also important is to understand the usage of the word shall as will be seen in clause 1 of article 16. So article 16 1, it says that there shall be equality of opportunity for all citizens in matters relating to employment or appointment to any office under the state. At the same time in clause 2, which reads, no citizen shall on grounds only on religion, race, caste, sex, descent, place of birth, residence or any of them be ineligible for be ineligible for or discriminated against in respect of any employment or office under the state. So in simple words, discrimination in any form in terms of the parameters defined is prohibited. Now let us go through the clause 3, 4, 5 of the same article that is article 16 and understand the importance of the word nothing in this article. Now I have highlighted nothing in the article in clause 3, clause 4 and clause 4a. Now when we have used this clause nothing in this article, what does it mean? It simply means one thing. The constitution of India grants state government the power to reserve vacancies for backward sections and even grant reservation in matter of promotion for post under it. This can be done if state believes that reserved categories are inadequately represented in public services under it. So the important point is what state believes in this case. If the state believes that communities are not adequately represented, they may take action based on quantifiable data. At the same time, if the states do not believe that the communities are not properly represented, then there is no such need. This is further clarified through the statement that, however, it is not an obligation on the part of the state to provide the reservation. As already mentioned, since this is under discretion of the state, so it cannot be an obligation. So what is the entire crux of the story? The entire crux of the story is that the meaning of the Supreme Court can be interpreted in the form that various provisions written in the part 3, which is the fundamental rights of the constitution, leave the entitlement on the discretion of the state while various provisions mandate the state to provide certain rights. So those provisions which are under the discretion of the state can be implemented by the state according to the quantifiable data. And for other provisions, the state has an obligation to implement the same. And this is what the Supreme Court decision is all about in this case. Now let us try to understand the same topic of fundamental rights and enabling provisions by understanding some of the provisions of part 3 that is fundamental rights itself. Now we have taken this example from article 17 which actually abolishes untouchability in India. At the same time article 25 2 which relates to regulation of religious activities. Now let's pay attention to article 17 which says that untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. The enforcement of any disability arising out of untouchability shall be an offence and punishable in accordance with law. Which means that any kind of untouchability if it is practiced, it is more of a criminal offence. And hence the state is very clear about the implementation of these provisions. And hence the state has implemented Protection of Civil Rights Act of 1955 and SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1988. At the same time, if we pay attention to Article 25.2, it clearly mentions nothing in this article shall affect the operations of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law first 
regulating or restricting any economic, financial, political or other secular activity which may be associated with religious practice. It goes on to clarify in clause B, providing for social welfare and reform or throwing open of Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes and sections of Hindu. Now it clearly says that state can make laws for regulating secular activities. Now the important point is the state can make. So in this context, a state has enacted various laws in matters of dealing with many religious practices. However, it has left many practices unregulated as it is not mandatory for the state to do so. So in this context, you can see that the difference between fundamental rights and enabling provisions that we have seen in practice as well. Page number 10 of today's newspaper presents an editorial which talks about safeguarding the data. Now this editorial covers an important aspect of a move from the Tamil Nadu government which has declared that eight districts of Kaveri Basin as protected special agriculture zone. It has also been mentioned that Tamil Nadu government has favored food security over energy greed. Now as far as this article is concerned, this is important from the perspective of polity and governance and also from the perspective of economy. At the same time, when we talk about agriculture, this topic is also related to environment and ecology as it brings to light an important issue of groundwater contamination. In this context, let's try to understand the entire story in full detail. Now the farmers of the Kaveri Delta region have been protesting about the exploration of methane, hydrocarbon, oil and natural gas and related acquisition of fertile land for well drilling. Now we are aware of the fact that India as a country is looking forward for energy security. And for this purpose, it is important to have our resources supplying energy to us so that we are immune to the fluctuations in global market. In this context, the government is eyeing oil and natural gas reserves as projected in the Krishna, Godavari and Kaveri Basin area. In this context, it is important for us to know the chronology of the event. Now, as already mentioned, that the protests have been going on for the last one decade. At the same time, Neduvasal in Podokatai and Kadira Mangalam in Thanjore have been the nerve center for the protests. Because of these protests, in 2013, state government ordered suspension of exploration for coal bed methane in Thanjore and Tiruvir and in 2015, government imposed a ban on such activities altogether. However, protesters could not feel the relief as in 2017, the central government signed contracts for hydrocarbon extraction from 31 areas of discovered small fields including Neduvasal. Now Neduvasal was already in news because of these kind of protests. So in 2013, suspension was ordered and in 2015, the ban was imposed. At the same time, in 2017, the central government signed contract. Now in 2019, the situation became explosive again when Vedanta Limited was allowed to conduct tests for 274 hydrocarbon wells in the Tamil Nadu and Puducherry region. Now the farmers protested because they believed that this kind of an exploration would lead to contamination of groundwater and this would have negatively impacted the agriculture yield of the region, thereby snatching the livelihood of lakhs of farmers. In 2020, Government of India has unilaterally amended the Environment Impact Assessment Notification of 2006 and as a byproduct of this amendment, there is an exemption in terms of prior environmental clearance and public consultation for oil and gas exploration. So this actually paved the way for oil exploration in the region and this was against the wish of the people who are residing in the area. And hence, Tamil Nadu government has issued a notification where eight district of Kaveri region are declared as protected special agriculture zone. And in this context, we'll try to understand this news a little further. Now it is also important from the perspective of prelims examination 
about the path of Kaveri River and important sites which are related from the perspective of the prelims examination. So the blue line that you can see here is the Kaveri River. And just near to this blue line, that is Kaveri River, there is a Ramsar site. So there is a Ramsar site by the name of Point Kalimir. This is an important bird century that you must definitely follow. This is also known as Kudyukarai Wildlife and Bird Century. Now, this is more of a dry evergreen forest, mangrove and wetland. And now when you talk about the winter migrants on this Ramsar site, spoon-billed sandpiper and greater flamingos are important in this context. Apart from that, there are two dams as well on this river. First is the Metur Dam and second is the Krishna Raj Sagara Reservoir. Now from the perspective of the prelims examination, especially in the field of geography, you must know that Amravati River, Noeli River, Bhavani River, Kabini or Kapila River, Shimsa River are the major tributaries of Kaveri. Now let's go back to our original discussion. Now we have displayed on the screen a map which talks about India's sedimentary basin. Now in this case, the first block tells us about proven commercial productivity basin. And this entire region of Krishna, Godavari, Kaveri, you can see here, has been declared as proven commercial productivity basin. And this is what the point of discussion is in this context. Now let us try to understand the kind of challenge this entire situation has created. Now in 2017, Government of India has delineated 45 villages which covered 23,000 hectares in the Delta region as petroleum, chemical and petrochemical investment region. The Government of India is also eyeing an investment of around 90,000 crore in this region. And the entire proposition of protected special agriculture zone has raised the question mark on this ambitious scheme. Now it is also important for us to understand why this Kaveri Delta is important for us. Now in terms of agriculture yield, the Kaveri region produces around 23 lakh tons of grain. And in terms of Tamil Nadu, this is considered its rice bowl. At the same time, this region also has largest oil and gas reserves in India. As already mentioned, India is trying to reach to an energy security. And in this context, the interest of central government and the state government appears to be antagonistic in nature. So this will actually lead to multiple types of debates in the time to come. First such debate could be hydrocarbon exploration versus food security. And we will definitely have opinion about both of them. Hydrocarbon exploration is important from the factor of energy security. At the same time, food security has emerged as the greatest challenge for most of the developing world. In this case, can India afford to sacrifice its food security, especially from a highly fertile area like Kaveri Delta? Another important aspect is debate over agriculture and industrialization. Now, when you talk about the debate between agriculture and industrialization, one thing has been brought to a notice every now and then. In 2008, to 2010, during the period of global recession, it was the demand from agriculture field which allowed India to tide over this difficult phase. At the same time, in the current period, from 2016 onwards, we have seen that the demand from the agriculture area has come down and that is why the growth of Indian economy is not as fast as expected. So we need to understand what kind of economic development model that we want to put across in terms of the priorities of the time. Apart from these regular discussion, we also need to focus on the political implications for both the central and the state governments. Now we are aware of the fact that India is a federal country where power is distributed between state and the union. Land and agriculture related issues come under the purview of state. And in this case, policies adopted by state government seem antagonistic to the policy adopted by the union government. So we can expect a showdown between the central government and the state government in the time to come. Apart from that, agriculture is a very sensitive issue for a country like India. 
and political compulsions will also play its role in the time to come. However, there is more to be discussed about this analysis and as the story develops, we will bring that for you. With this, let's move to the next news. Page number one of today's newspaper highlights a news which talks about Supreme Court uphold changes to the SCST atrocities law. Now, this topic is very important from the perspective of polity and governance and details of this article are relevant for prelims as well as for mains. At the same time, this particular issue also has impact on social justice. So by this logic, the impact value of this particular article is very high for prelims as well as for mains and also for multiple subjects like polity and governance and for social justice. Let's try to understand the context of the news. Now in the article, it has been highlighted that Supreme Court has upheld the 2018 amendment which barred anticipatory bills to persons who are accused of committing atrocities against those belonging to scheduled caste and scheduled tribe community. At the same time, this article clarifies that High Court has the inherent power to grant anticipatory bail in cases in which prima facie an offence under anti-atrocities law is not made out. Another important observation of this decision is that in exceptional circumstances, the High Court has the power to quash cases to prevent the misuse of anti-atrocities law. Now, it is important here to know that Supreme Court's observations are based on the report of NCRB, which highlights that provisions are misused, especially under SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989. In this context, it is important for you to understand what is the meaning of anticipatory bail. Now, anticipatory bail has been defined under section 438 of Criminal Procedure Code and it clearly states that when any person has reason to believe that he may be arrested on an accusation of having committed a non billable offence, he may apply to the High Court or the Court of Session for the direction under this section and that court, if it may think fit, direct in the event of such arrest, he shall be released on bail. Now, it is also important here to know that offences are normally categorized under two heads. First is bailable and other is non-bailable offence. Now, non-bailable offence are those offences in which bail can only be granted by the court and not by an officer. Application for bail has to be made in the court in such cases of non-billable offence. So this is a defining element in terms of what is billable and non-billable offence. Now in the context of the article, it is important for it to know that under the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989, there are some important provisions. Now when we talk about section 3 of the Act, this lists punishable offences under the Act which include first forcing a member of Shul caste or Shul tribe community to drink or eat inedible or obnoxious substance. Second, acts which are intended to cause injury, insult or annoyance to any SCST member. Forcibly removing clothes or parading them naked is also a punishable offence. Apart from that, wrongful occupation of land, coercing them into forced labour, forcing them to vote in favour of a particular candidate, assault or use of force, denying them access to public place and forcing them to leave his or her house is also under the punishable category. Now under the same act, section 18 highlights prohibition of grant of anticipatory bail to the accused. Now section 4 further says that a public servant willfully neglecting his duties required to be performed by him under this act shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term from six months to one year. Further, in order to ensure neutrality in such type of investigations, it has been mandated that investigation under the Act must be carried out by a deputy superintendent of police level officer. So these are the provisions which were made to ensure that people from SCST communities do not feel discriminated and if in case, if any kind of discrimination is meted out to them, then it can be punished. 
At the same time, NCRB in its report has highlighted that there has been a misuse of this provision. Now it is very important for us to understand the chronology of event. First, Dr. Subhash Kashinath vs. State of Maharashtra 2018 judgment. In this particular judgment, the court has clearly highlighted that there is no absolute bar against grant of anticipatory bail. And court held that under section 438 of CRPC, such bail cannot be refused. One of the premises of the judgment was that the court believed that law was abused to file false complaints. The court also pointed out that the law has been misused to blackmail innocent public servant and private individual to wreak personal vengeance or serve vested interest. For this particular purpose, the NCRB data was quoted. It was clearly mentioned that conviction rate under the Act has reduced drastically from 35% in 2010 to 28% in 2015. Court highlighted this data to deduce that some of the cases which are filed under this Act are based on malintention. The court further said that around 75% of the cases that reached court, the accused were either acquitted for lack of evidence or the cases were withdrawn or dismissed. Since such is the condition of the implementation of this act and hence anticipatory bail cannot be refused to individuals. Apart from this, Supreme Court also gave some of the provisions for the protection of the interest of public servant. Now one such provision is that Supreme Court ruled against the automatic arrest of the accused under the Shudulka Shudultrive Prevention of Atrocities Act. Once a complaint is registered under SCST Act, a preliminary inquiry should be completed within seven days, pending which it is not mandatory to arrest the accused. Earlier, there was a tradition in which when the inquiry was pending, then arrests were made and hence court ruled against it. Another important aspect is arrest only with the approval of appointing authority. If the accused is a public servant, it is mandatory for the police to seek approval of the appointing authority for the arrest of the person. So these provisions were made by the Supreme Court to simplify the process for public servants in such cases. Apart from this, there is one more provision which talked about approval of SSP. If the accused is not a government official, permission from SSP or senior superintendent of police is mandatory for making such arrest. So in this case, we can see that court has taken cognizance for public servant as well as for private individuals. The underlying idea was to ensure that the provisions of the act are not misused against any one of them, be it public servant or the private individual. Now, the observation from the Supreme Court challenged the deterrent nature of the provisions of this Act and hence Parliament introduced an amendment in 2018. Section 18A was inserted in the Act and this reaffirms the, origis and this reaffirmed the original legislative intention that Section 438 CRPC is not applicable to accused booked under the atrocities law. So in this case, right of anticipatory bail was taken away under the provision of the Act. Now this amendment was again challenged in the Supreme Court. Prithviraj Chauhan case of 2018 challenged insertion of Section 18A and Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Section 18A of the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Amendment Act of 2018. At the same time, the court highlighted that high courts have an inherent power to grant anticipatory bail in cases in which prima facie an offence under the anti-atrocities law is not made out. So it means that it is left to the judgment of the court to grant anticipatory bail on case by case basis. The court also observed that high court in exceptional cases could quash cases to prevent the misuse of anti-atrocities law as had already been highlighted under the NCRB report. Some of the other important observations which are made by court are, first, while sometimes, mostly in urban areas, false accusations are made, 
those are not necessarily reflective of the prevailing and widespread social prejudice against the member of the social class. Second is, unless the provisions of the Act are enforced in their true letter and spirit, the dream and ideal of casteless society will remain only a dream or a mirage. Liberal use of power to grant pre-arrest bail would defeat the intention of the parliament. And last significant observation was, all humans are treated as humans, that their innate genius is allowed outlets through equal opportunities and each of them is fearless in the pursuit of her or his dreams. So in this way, you can see that the court has tried to find a balance between the need and misuse of anticipatory bail. At the same time, the court appreciated the insertion of section 18a and tried to balance it by giving powers to high court for the inherent power and question the cases in the exceptional cases. Page number 13 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about US not for air defense system sale to India. Now this news is still in transition at the same time this news is important from the perspective of science and technology as it relates to the subtopic of defense. Now as highlighted in the news itself the US Department of State has approved potential sale of rupees 1.8 billion dollar integrated air defense weapon system that is IADWS. In the context of the news let's pay attention to the multi-layered air defense system which India is planning to install to ensure safety and security of cities as well as strategic interests. This is very important in terms of ensuring safety and security for national assets. Also important here is that defense system like IADWS are important for cities as well. In this context, let's focus on layered approach which focusing on developing protection which depends on first the origin of the threat. Now it is important here to understand that there are multiple ways of ensuring safety and security of the assets. Now suppose this is the point A which is the point of destination in terms of host country and suppose this is the point Y which is say enemy country. Any kind of missile installation which is targeted at our country can be destroyed by origin of threat system. It means any possible threat can be neutralized at the enemy country itself and that is what the idea of origin of threat that is range of missile. Second important aspect is capability of interception. It means killing the weapon which is on its way towards the host country. In this case, any missile from enemy country which is traveling to our destination can be killed through a defense system. And this is what the idea is in terms of layered approach. Now when we talk about the layered approach, the first layer will have a two tier ballistic missile defense system. Now when we talk about first layer, it basically comprises of ballistic missile that have ranges up to 5000 kilometers and they will be under the category of intercontinental ballistic missiles. DRDO is developing two tier ballistic missile defense system so that it can intercept ballistic missile at altitude both outside that is exo and inside that is endo the atmosphere. Now when we talk about the endo system developed by DRDO, it is a single stage solid rocket propelled advanced air defense system or AAD. It is low altitude interceptor missile by the name of Ashwin. This AAD missile system is primarily designed to intercept enemy missiles in endo atmospheric at an altitude of 20 to 40 kilometers from the surface of the earth. Now after the endo there will be a second layer which will be called EXO. Now when we talk about EXO it means now Prithvi air defense vehicle known as Pradumna ballistic missile interceptor is designed to destroy missiles with a range of 300 to 2000 km at exo atmosphere that is about 80 km altitude. For higher altitude that is up to 150 km Agni 5 based missile interceptor would be used because the range is around 5000 km. Now in this context it is important for you to know that the procurement of S-400 Triumph missile defense system will be part of second layer. Now we are aware of the fact that in October 2018 India has signed a deal with Russia to acquire 
S400 multi-layered air defense system. Because of this, the US has threatened India to impose sanction under CATSA. Now, US has taken actions on other countries which have purchased S-400. Turkey is one such country which has procured weapons from the Russia and US has cancelled F-35 training program with them. At the same time, in order to bag multi-billion dollar contract, USA is offering THART and Patriot as alternative to S-400 to India. Now, as already mentioned that S-400 is a multi-layered defense system which can intercept all types of aerial targets including aircrafts, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs and ballistic and cruise missiles up to the range of 400 kilometers. This will be a very potent weapon system which will ensure safety and security of the national assets. Now the kind of air defense missile system which India is looking for is multi-layered. So there will be four layers in which the layer 3 would be manned by Barrack 8 long and medium range surface to air missile. This is jointly developed by India and Israel and it will have an interception range of around 70 to 100 kilometers. The fourth layer will have Akash medium range surface to air missiles and India has two regiment of indigenously developed Akash system which are capable of multi-target engagement. It can strike targets up to range of 25 kilometers at an altitude of 18,000 meters. So these are the details of the multi-layer air defense system which India is trying to make. This is important more from the perspective of the prelims examination and these facts should be kept handy for revision from time to time. Page number one of today's newspaper highlights important news which talks about review court can refer questions to larger bench. Now in this particular news, a nine judge constitutional bench of the Supreme Court has upheld the decision of five judge Sabrimala review bench to refer to a larger bench questions on the ambit and scope of religious freedom practiced by multiple faith across the country. Now in this context, the Chief Justice of India, Mr. S.A. Bob Day, has framed seven questions for discussion. First, what is the scope and ambit of religious freedom under the Article 25 of the Constitution? Second is, what is the interplay between the religious freedom and rights of religious denomination under Article 26? Next is whether religious denominations are subject to fundamental rights. Fourth is what is the definition of morality used in the article 25 and 26. Next is what is the ambit and scope of judicial review of article 25. What is the meaning of the phrase sections of Hindu under article 25 2b. And last is whether a person not belonging to a religious group can question the practice and belief of the group in a PIL petition. Now, as far as these questions are concerned, these questions are important not only from the political aspect, but will also highlight issues of social and moral fabric of the country. As already discussed in the previous article, we have talked about fundamental rights and enabling provisions. This particular article will give us clarity about what enabling provisions are and what is the extent of state's discretion in terms of making laws for people which are enlisted under part 3 of the Indian constitution. At the same time, this entire topic is in the process of development and this analysis is very important from the perspective of the examination. So, we will wait for proper analysis to come out and point by point we will discuss each and every aspect of this news. Till that time, you should be clear about the questions that Supreme Court has framed in order to understand the implications of Article 25, 26 and enabling provisions on the democratic fabric of the country. As already mentioned, this is not limited to political aspect but it also relates to social and moral fabric. And hence, this news item is very important for your understanding. We believe and expect that in the next few days, there will be more articles which will be covering the respective portions and we will take them for analysis. Page number 8 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about draft policy on rare disease notified. Now, a similar article was covered on 24th of November 2019 in which rare disease has been dealt in detail. So, it is expected from you to go back to this article and revise this topic from the DNS of 
24th of November 2019. Page number 20 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about India moves to include elephant bustard in global conservation list. Now this article is important because 13th conference of parties that is 13 COP of the conservation of migratory species is scheduled to be held from 17 to 22 February in Gandhi Nagar, Gujarat. Now we are aware of the fact that migratory species are those animals that move from one habitat to another during different times of the year due to various factors such as food, sunlight, temperature and climate. In order to protect migratory species throughout their range of countries, a convention on conservation of migratory species that is CMS has been enforced under the aegis of United Nations Environment Programme. It is also referred to as Bonn Convention. The agreement under CMS may range from legally binding treaties, which are called as agreements, to less formal instruments, which are called as Memorandum of Understanding. India has signed non-legally binding Memorandum of Understanding on the conservation and management of Siberian cranes, marine turtles, dugongs, and raptors. In this context, let's take up the question for practice. With reference to Convention on Migratory Species, that is CMS, consider the following statements. First, it is the only global convention that specializes in conservation of migratory species, their habitats, and migration routes. This is correct. It works under the aegis of International Union for Conservation of Nature. This is incorrect, as we know that it works under the aegis of UNEP. Third is, the agreement under the CMS are legally binding on the parties. We know that apart from legally binding, non-legally binding memoranda for understanding are also signed. And hence, statement 3 is also incorrect. Now we have to find which of the statement given above is are correct. By this logic, the correct answer is option A, that is one only. Second practice question has also been taken from page number 20, where in brief there is a news about Solar Orbiter Mission to Reveal Sun's Secret. In this context, let's take up a question. Which of the following space mission deals with exploration of sun's atmosphere? Now in this context, first is Parker Pro, second is Aditya L1 mission, and third is Bepi Colombo. Now we know that both Parker Probe and Aditya L1 are related to exploration of sun's atmosphere, and they are correct. At the same time, Bepi Colombo is not related to this. Bepi Colombo is a joint mission of the European Space Agency and Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency for the planet Mercury. And hence, in this context, the correct answer is option B, that is 1 and 2 only. With this, we have come to the end of today's session. Let's move to the question of the day. The question for the day is, under the Article 16 of the Constitution, citizen cannot be discriminated on the basis of one of the following first religion second ethnicity third caste fourth residence we have to select the correct answer using the code given below option a reads one and two only option b reads two and three only option c reads one two and three and option d reads one three and four 